Hello and welcome back to Real Analysis. And as always, first I want to thank all the nice people that support this channel on Steady or PayPal. Now in today's part 38, we will finally talk about examples of derivatives. Since we have already talked about all the definitions, we can immediately start with the examples. A simple example we have already discussed would be a linear function, so f of x is given by x. And there, the derivative function f' is given by the constant function with constant 1. Now, I showed you this again because it's helpful when we want to calculate the derivative of more complicated functions. In particular, we can use it for the quadratic function, where f of x is given by x squared. Because this is simply x times x, where we can use the product rule. Here, the important thing you should see is that we have two differentiable functions in the product. So the product rule, as we learned it, is applicable. So we don't change the first function times the derivative of the second function. Plus the other way around, so we have 1 times x. This works for all points x, so we get out our derivative function f', prime, which is just 2 times x. So there you see, we can immediately apply our calculation rules for derivatives. Therefore, I would say let's continue this and let's look at the cubic function. Hence, there we have the power 3, which can be written as a product as well, namely we have x squared times x. So here we can put in, we already know x squared is differentiable and x is differentiable, and we already know the derivatives. In other words, the product rule is also applicable. So first, let's keep x squared times the derivative of x, plus the derivative of x squared, which is 2 times x, times x. In summary, we can put everything together and we get 3 times x squared. So here you see, without dealing with difference quotients, we immediately got the derivative function of the cubic function. Okay, now at this point you should ask, what is the general rule for the derivative when we have the function x to the power n? So here we have the function xn, and when you look at the examples before, you might have a conjecture. Namely, put the original power in front and reduce the power by 1. So here we would have n times x to the power n minus 1. And in fact, this is correct and you can prove it easily by induction and using the product rule as before. So you see, this is a good exercise for you for a proof by induction. Okay, then with this we are ready for the general example of a polynomial function. As we have already discussed, the general formula looks like this, where we have coefficients a0, a1 and so on. Now what we can do is simply using the sum rule and the product rule if you want to calculate the derivative. This means that we can form the derivative for every term in the sum separately. Then we don't change the coefficient, we put the power in front and reduce the power by 1. What we get out is this new polynomial where the last coefficient a0 has vanished. The new constant term is now a1. Okay, here you see, now we have a lot of examples where you immediately know the derivative of. Of course, a natural question here would be, can we generalize this formula even more? And what I mean by that is, are we able to calculate the derivative of a power series? Roughly speaking, it's just an infinite polynomial. Therefore, maybe we can just do the same as before. Which means that we put the power k in front times x to the power k minus 1. And since the constant term a0 will vanish, we now start the series at 1. However, the whole thing is not clear at all, because this is not a finite sum as before. Please note, we have a limit process here, and the sum rule does not apply to this. Therefore, the question is still open, can we do something like this? And indeed, in some sense we can do this when we use the result from the last video. Okay, the general result for power series we discussed now is very important and you really should remember it because we can apply it to a lot of functions. Now the assumption we have here is that f is given by a power series where the domain is given by this interval and r is the radius of convergence. Therefore, here we already know we have a well-defined continuous function here. And now the question is, is it also differentiable? In order to answer that, we have to bring in the uniform convergence. Indeed, the power series is uniformly convergent if we restrict it to a compact interval. And the notation we use here is just the interval from minus c to c, which lies in the interval minus r to r. 
If this is a little bit confusing, I can explain this with a sequence of functions. Let's call the function gn, where the domain is given by minus c to c, and the definition is that we have the finite sum where the end index is n. And this sequence of functions is indeed uniformly convergent, where the limit function is of course f, restricted to the domain minus c to c. Now, the interesting thing is we get the same result for the new power series here. In the same sense as before, this series is also uniformly convergent on every compact interval inside the domain. Then, when you look at the sequence of functions, you immediately see this is indeed the derivative of the function gn. Hence, we have uniform convergence for the derivatives. And therefore, we can apply the result from the last video. So f is differentiable and the derivative is given by the limit function of these derivatives. So exactly our presumption we had before. Okay, then let's use the next minutes to prove this general result. So let's start with the proof for 1. There we just need to show that the supremum norm of f minus gn goes to 0. Of course, when we write the supremum norm here, we mean the supremum norm with the domain minus c to c. Now, by the definition of gn, we can immediately calculate this difference here. It's still an infinite sum inside the supremum norm, but now we start with n plus 1. Simply because we subtract all the terms from 0 to n. Okay, now by the definition of the supremum norm, this is simply the supremum of the absolute value. And the limit here we have for the series we can just pull out, because the absolute value is a continuous function. We do this whole rewriting because then here we have the absolute value with a finite sum inside. And this means we can use the triangle inequality. So then we have the same sum, but the absolute value is now inside. And now you should see this x to the power k is maximal when we put in c. Hence in the next estimate we can just omit the supremum. In the same step we can pull in the limit again, which gives us this nice formula now. Now a standard argument for power series we can use now is that the whole thing is dominated by a geometric series. So here we have a constant b and a number q which is less than 1. It's simply the major end criterion with the geometric series. If you have never seen this, let me explain you how this explanation works. By assumption the original series f is convergent when we put in a number r tilde, which is between c and the convergence radius r. Here please recall, we know because we have the closed interval in the open interval that there are numbers r tilde in between. Indeed, this is what we need here. So we know this sequence here has to go to 0 when k goes to infinity. In particular we find a constant b such that the whole sequence is bounded by this b. So let's flip the two sides and then let's reformulate the right hand side here. First clearly we can write it like this. And then we introduce the number r tilde divided by c. And this number should be q to the power minus 1. So let's bring it on the other side and we get b times q to the power k dominates the absolute value of a k times c to the power k. And there you see, this is exactly what we have put in in our inequality before. Ok, going back to this, we now only have to consider this convergent geometric series. Now, when n goes to infinity, by definition of convergence, this goes to zero. Which means we have indeed the uniform convergence of gn to f. Ok, then we know we can do the same proof for the second part, where we consider the derivatives of gn. It works the same simply because we have again a power series where only the coefficients are different. And as you can calculate, also the radius of convergence r stays the same here. So you see, we have the uniform convergence of the derivatives and therefore part 3 follows from the last video. In fact, we only need the pointwise convergence for the functions, but we also have the uniform convergence there. Now combining these two things, we get that f is differentiable with the wanted derivative. Ok, then I would say to close this video, let's look at some final examples. Of course, we already know some functions that are given by power series. For example, the most famous one was the exponential function. Now applying the rule from above, we get for the derivative of the exponential function, the infinite series. Where we start at 1, we have our coefficient 1 divided by k factorial, 
times k times x to the power k minus 1. And now you should see here we can cancel 1k out here. And indeed what remains is just k minus 1 factorial. Now one common thing one can do here is doing an index shift such that we start with k is equal to 0 again. In other words, k minus 1 should simply be the new k. Then everything looks simpler, we just have x to the power k divided by k factorial. The only thing we have to check here is that we actually hit the same terms with both infinite sums. Which is obviously correct here. And now what we see here is that we get out the same power series again as before, so the derivative function of the exponential function is the exponential function again. Ok, so you see, working with power series is not so hard and we get out immediately nice results. Ok, then the last example for today would be the sine function as a power series. One possibility to write this as a power series is to consider an index m, where we only consider the odd powers of x. Indeed, we already defined this as the sine function in part 33. And now we are able to calculate the derivative of the sine function. Ok, now in the first step you see we can also start with the index 0, because a constant term here is not involved. And then we do the same thing as before, we bring the power down and then we reduce the power by 1. And then you see we can cancel one factor again. So what remains is just 1 divided by 2m factorial. Now, maybe not so surprising, here we have a power series where we only find the even powers of x. And indeed, this power series is called the cosine of x. So the derivative of the sine function is the cosine function. And maybe now a good exercise for you is to calculate the derivative of the cosine function. Ok, then I think these are enough examples for today. Then in the next video we can calculate the derivative of the logarithm function. Therefore, I hope I see you there and have a nice day. Bye!